Welcome to another virtual tasting with Benny's Beverage Depot. I am Pat, joined by Brett, of course, from the Whiskey Hotline uh, remotely today uh, due to inclement weather. Uh, our special guest today is Dan Farber, our good friend Dan Farber, who you've seen the last couple of weeks on our Brandy episodes. Uh, but we did want to, Dan tends to be humble about uh, the quality and the interesting types of brandy he makes. And we wanted to have a week where we can let him kind of spotlight his distillery for once and talk about some really cool, seriously uh, gourmet, you know what, as Samuel L. Jackson would say in uh, Pulp Fiction. I think that was from Pulp Fiction, right? Um, <laughs> the burger quote, right? Uh, anyway. A damn good burger. <laughs> so while Dan makes some damn good brandy, and uh, I think more importantly, you know, not like a lot of other brandies made in America. In America, it's it's easy as just fermenting some grapes and throwing in a column still and throwing in in any old type of barrel. Sure. And we can realistically call it brandy. And that's there's brandy, and then there's like brandy, like get what gets made on that beautiful piece of equipment behind Dan, right, Brett? And remember, this is yeah. And there's there, there, and remember, this is also a piece. With, you know, when we talked to both in the first episode and when we were talking. To the gentleman from Laird's, th this is what Dan is doing is also part of the evolution of where, you know, we talked about American brandy going through a few different phases and Dan's a big part of one of the phases, which is what we're going to talk about, which is that French mentality applied to American materials. So that's kind of oh. where we start. Is that right, Dan? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I, you know, I... You know, as I've said before, like I really got started with this in the, I started distilling in the early 80s and really was, had a small, you know, couple barrel brewery at the time. I was really a, a brewer and, and uh, became, well, once I learned about Scotch whiskey, I, I, I thought like this stuff starts where brewing ends. And I really thought at that time, you know, I thought, dang, you know, there are so many brewers in this country. Uh, the world would be a lot better off if we lost one brewer there to decent brewer and picked up a really poor quality brandy or not brandy producer, a distiller in the United States. Because I really didn't <laughs> I thought we should have them, you know, and I was willing to sort of shoulder that burden to sort of, you know, make a small distillery. Well, as it turns out, obviously, like nobody has an original thought ever. So I it wasn't, I wasn't really the only one, but there were certainly just a, a couple of us at that time. But when I looked around, I, 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 I had first, like my first business plan was penciled out for something that today would be called American single malt. That's what I really love. And I thought like, why is that? Like what I, I didn't want to put in the time effort that I knew it would be, I, I always knew it would be decades. I always, and, and, and in fact, kind of wanted it to be decades. Cause I, knew that that's what it took to make great brown spirits. Um, and I thought, is that the thing? Is that the thing that's gonna put the United States on the map? Like, you know, what is it? Or not even the United States, California, because there was great whiskey being made in the United States. I knew it. It's just, is that the thing that California has to offer the world in terms of a unique thing, right? And I thought, no, most likely when I think of California, I think of fruit. And so I thought that's what, that's maybe the unique product that California has to offer, a type of fruit, which is intrinsic to California. And so that meant brandy. So I, I quickly sort of said, okay, well, I just, that, that's gonna be the direction I go in. So I need to sort of learn about brandies or you know, learn more about how the great brandies of the world are made. And so I uh, began traveling you know, to France and visiting, the regions, you know, and I say that the only wise business decision I've ever made was not to pursue white eau de vies, which I love. I mean, I really love. We've but, tried those a couple of times in the stores, man. That's uh, that's a tough, that's a tough road to uh, to pave in the United States. That's crazy. Yeah, tough. and you know, so here, you know, where I was based, where I still am based, was above Silicon Valley. We were sort of, you know, before it was called Silicon Valley, it was the heartland of all those stone fruits, apricots, plums, prunes, you know, pears. So we still had a few remaining orchards that certainly, you know, have mm -hmm. great quality fruits we could have sourced from, but we just, I decided not to go that way. The other reason was because, and I'll step away 
you know, from this part of the facility and go into the other part of the facility a little bit later, was that you don't really have as much um, ability to coax uh, a, 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 an aid spirit. It's not that white spirits don't age, but they age in a different way um, and for a different purpose. Uh, and really it was the brown spirits that, that, that caught my fancy, you know, the way they mm -hmm. develop and the way they change and the way they mature with time. So then I decided to, do so, so, uh, uh, so that was really why we, I do what, what, that's why I started it. That's what we continue to do. That's all we continue. To what do. year was this? What year was the Brandy Epiphany? 83, 84, something like that. Okay. You know, and so roughly to... two decades before anybody else started considering small scale distillation. No, outside of a couple people. Yeah. Well, yeah. who was around? I mean, California had a few, I mean, in California, you certainly had a few would, would um, the, the Charbet, the Karakasavics, right? Yep. And George would have been the precursor of St. George, would have been ahead well, of Lance, right? It was St. George. It was just your Roof, you know. Was, York. And yep. then were the, were um, RMS. RMS was there. Ish. We're missing. We're I missing mean, even Hubert. though they're a big, yeah. and then Hubert, of course. Yeah, of course. Hubert had already started. And, and then was it Fritz Maytag distilling yet in San Francisco? No, but, but, uh, but Randall Graham was distilling in Bonnie Dune. Right. That's right, which you never think about because you, mm -hmm. is he even distilling anymore? I haven't seen any no. brandies from them in years. No. He, 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 he got rid of the... <coughs> uh, uh, so, so there was an end and, and, and Steve McCarthy at Clinton. Right, up in Oregon. So there was, like, you know, I didn't know all those at the time, um, but, uh, but the minute you poke... Well, why, around, didn't you just go why didn't you just Google them? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> right, right. So, and actually to find the still, you know, like that was a whole, uh, th that's a story in and of itself. Like, how do you find a still? Because there was no Google, there was no this, I didn't speak French. And well, and Van Dome was making, you know, stills for photo, probably making stills for like photographic equipment. And stuff. Yeah. yeah, and everything but the little bit they did for Kentucky distillers. Because remember right. at the time, there would have been, I mean, a lot of the bourbon industry would have been relatively depressed at that time too. Mm -hmm. That was in sort of the, the bottom of production for a lot of them. Right, mm -hmm. I did contact Vendom because I was able to find out that there was an American still producer, da, 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 da. But, the, but, but, but in this sort of, um, it's kind of part and parcel of like how I approached it. And that is that, uh, once I, I kind of started at right, like a high level, like uh, distillation, right? And then narrowed it down yet another step, like California, and then fruit, right? And then from fruit, you know, to brown spirits, right? And then once you get there, right? Once you get to fruit and brown spirits, you're really talking about the whole world uses certain types of instruments to produce those those brandies right and it's a very small section of instruments that are used to produce those brandies and so um you know i it's sort of like the the the, the notion is sort of like uh uh you know the butterfly's wing affecting the hurricane traveling across the atlantic ocean right i still think that you know, these artistic endeavors are very subtle and things come out a certain, well, I mean, it's, it's, it's viewed the same way in Scotland, right? If you're gonna remake that hat, you put back in the same dent, right? Mm -hmm. So you don't really wanna tinker with success because it's very hard to know from whence that comes, you know, where, where, you know, what is it? So because of that, you see behind me like very classical instrumentation. So even though I wanted to work with an American company, I was highly motivated to work with Vendome, um, it seemed to me that if the types of spirits that I wanted to produce were in this sort of stylistic range of these classic brandies of Europe uh, or, or classic brandies period, it just happened to be they were all coming from Europe, then I needed instruments that um, could provide me 
the ability to to play with those styles. And so that's why. So, yep. So there. So well. So so what else? Just for kind. So what else in the brandy world? Throw away, you know, Jorg and and the Karakasovics and and um and and Hubert just for a second. What was the state of the brandy industry in the United States at that time? Just so folks have context. You know, you had Laird's, of course, would have been producing. Yep. Although, uh, you know, Apple Brandy and then basically making Apple Jack. Um, mm-hmm. Gallo, of course, would have been producing. They they would have had a couple of different facilities, right? I mean, yep. were they still running those big Italian pot stills? Uh, or no? Or were they just on column. column by then? Yeah. Right? And then was O'Neill distilling at that point in time? Brothers. So who say? It was Christian Brothers. Okay. Mm. And, uh, and then, um, and then, and, and, and so Remy had come to the United States already and built their facility out in Carneros and had started to distill in 82, I believe. And they were, but they were still primarily, but everybody except for maybe Remy, they were still running primarily on column. Yeah. And then not long after that, by the late 80s, right? there was this kind of like a, a groundswell. So, so Suntory prior to its modern, Suntory built a, a quite a beautiful facility in the late eighties uh, in the Central Valley to produce brand with, with these types and of- And that's products. what Gallo, and that's what Gallo has now. Yep, yep, and that's what okay. Gallo has. So, so that was kind of the state of the state, at state, state of the country at that point in time. And, um, and you know we we didn't have vineyards, so we we purchased up until five years ago. We purchased all our fruit. We purchased fruit and did all our own wine. Always did all our own winemaking, all our own distillation, all our own. Thing. But but the fruit was purchased. And starting five years ago, we and it's too bad it couldn't be two places at once. I was hoping to be able to show you the vineyard as well to see like what the the what it takes from the landscape point of view and the and the agricultural point of view to produce brandies but i thought it was better to, to see some well that, that 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 ties into a question jake just asked which is what was yeah. it like going all the way back to the beginning in the first part what was it like trying to get fruit that was appropriate for a distillation when did you figure out what you needed and then how hard was it to source fruit appropriate for distillation versus winemaking yeah because it's not just like any other grapes growing you can and just maybe you gotta have to kind of, maybe, you probably need to explain that a little bit too as a lead-in for folks that aren't familiar with so you know and this kind of is a theme that runs through uh to a great extent like all of spirits production right so alcohol is kind of a um well, the negative, if I put it in the most negative terms, it's a nasty byproduct that we have to deal with. So it has, uh, it has uh, benefits, but they're limited. They're not infinite in terms of the benefits that alcohol brings to a spirit, right? So more is not necessarily better. And, you know, and zero is not necessarily better either. So it, it really is this balance of where you have enough alcohol to provide the maximum benefits that it gives and not too much to actually degrade. So if you think of the fruit, you're, you, you don't want to see the fruit have too much sugar because in fact, you produce too much alcohol and the alcohol then begins to dilute or make much more neutral brandies than you otherwise would get hmm. with less ripe fruit. So the, the ripeness of the fruit that we perceive in terms of a wine is very different than the ripeness that we want in terms of a brandy. And one of the reasons is because the still is concentrating by a factor of like eight to one. So this very dilute, you know, not very uh, impressive wine when concentrated by a fact, you know, by eight to one becomes very impressive. Whereas if you take a wine that's already got this level of concentration in it uh, that uh, makes the wine appealing to drink as wine, when you concentrate it by a factor, you know, of eight to one, it can be very heavy, typically more neutral, more dull, not certainly as 
flowery and floral. So the wines we want for distillation are quite different than the wines we would want to drink. And the grapes that we want for distillation in many cases are much different than, than the grapes we would want to produce wine to drink. So, but, but to answer the question in terms of the historical context, it was a good time then to be looking for fruit for distillation because there were these old vineyards around, many, many more, uh, you know, what we might consider to be heritage vineyards in California. There was Chenin Blanc in the Monterey County, um, which uh, used to go to Zaca Mesa, but, you know, we could get a piece of it. There was, there was Columbard in Monterey. This doesn't exist anymore. Really? Yeah. These vineyards have all been ripped out and replanted uh, to Chardonnay because there's a great big producer in Monterey that produces a lot of Chardonnay. And the market, you know, like there's not as much of, you know, like as a grape grower, like, you know, it's a lot harder to be selling into a market, you know, that doesn't have high demand. You, you know, you mean, you may or may not have a buyer for that fruit, you know, whereas if you're in a big market, Chardonnay, you know, like, you know, it, it, it typically is, is a better place to be. So all, no one replanted any Columbard in Monterey County. No one replanted any Chenin Blanc in Monterey County. Um, uh, uh, and these were old vine vineyards, you know, and they were so from Mendocino to Napa, Sonoma, you could find these beautiful old vine vineyards of varieties that were, you know, quite well suited uh, for distillation. And, and even, you know, from the time, you know, I first met Hubert, you know, who like was a huge influence uh, on, Hubert Germain Rabin was a huge influence on me, uh, super helpful and super encouraging to sort of learn about what California has to provide uniquely to the world of brandy, not to try to recreate, you know, one-to-one -one something from Cognac or Armagnac or someplace else, but to be informed by the beautiful brandies that, that there are there and to try to make something that expresses more of what we have here. So you know, he was always encouraging to work with different varieties. Let's find out what works, what doesn't. Um, and so, you know, that's evolved over time, you know, to where, you know, we now have certain plantings at our, at our vineyards that we feel are core to what we do. So we grow now, uh, maybe in, in, in decreasing order of, of vineyard space, uh, Faux Blanche, Pinot Noir, um, Semillon Montiel, Vignet, uh, uh, Folignon, and, and Riesling. And that's, those are the varieties that are presently being used uh, in our wines for distillation. So those are... Well, it and you kind of covered it, but there was another sort of a follow-up with Jake is you grow some, and it's on with what you're growing now, you're growing grapes that are well known for great wine in Northern California, particularly Pinot Noir and Viognier. Yep. Um, what was it, what, where, where in, how long in the process did it take for you and Hubert or Hubert and you to discover that they could actually make great brandy as well, considering you were, especially in Santa Cruz, you were in the heart of, at the time, great Pinot Noir territory. Yeah, but we, at the time, did not, uh, were not able to get, so remember, it's eight to one, right? So for every eight bottles of wine that you could sell or make, you produce one bottle of brandy. So, you know, that does place uh, some serious economic mess. So you say, oh, wait, wait, th that means you're using lesser quality fruit? No, not at all. But it does mean that you have to be able to work. You can't go into a market where people are producing brandy for still wine and just buy those grapes. You know, even right. if you were to purchase them less ripe, the grower would say, you know, those, the prices that they need to command for the way they had been growing those grapes would be different than we could afford to do. So we didn't have, and there was high demand for Santa Cruz mountain fruit at that time um, and not a lot of it. So we didn't, we didn't get that. We got Pinot Noir from other areas, but it was very, very early on that um, Pinot Noir uh, uh, became 
to be obvious in terms of its ability to make great brandies. I mean, after five or five years, you would know, you could you can tell it's a very precocious brandy. So it, it both ha it, it both shows well in youth and has the ability to age. You know, Colombard is quite a bit different. It's not so precocious. It doesn't it doesn't show its thing in youth as easily, but, but with age, it shows its true nobility and elegance. So it was pretty early on that we um, knew that things like Pinot Noir worked really well. Um, Viognier was just so, it's so gorgeous out of the shoot. And then the, then its ability to hold on to that very floral nature. Now, you know, this is a little different than the approach uh, you might, you might, I'll, I'll flip this around and just continue the discussion like in the other direction. This is a little different than you might think of in terms of um, the, the approach that you would take in Europe. Fundamentally different, right? So like in, 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 in Cognac or even to a great extent in Gascony where this still is much more common, um, you, you use typically a very limited set of, of fruits, uh, of, of, of grape types. Like, so yeah. think of really Uni Blanc as the, it is the primary grape of Cognac. And there's, there's a benefit to that. And there's also a downside to that. The benefit of that is if you want to see the effects of climate on, or terroir on a, a, a fruit, Cognac is like maybe one of the greatest places to see it because the, the vineyards are done the same way. The fruit is the same. The vinification, everything. The size the of the stills are practically the same, right? The stills are the same. Yeah. And they're like the other one over mm -hmm. there. And, um, and so the differences, the, the, the really uh, um, exciting and, and, and distinctive differences amongst the different crew of Cognac are really primarily a reflection of the changes in the climate and the soils and all those things. And it's mostly soil. But here in California, we just got through saying we're using these other grapes, these things like DNA, like super floral, super uh, uh, um, strong, you know, uh, much more elegant, but you know, Muscat is another one that kind of like just wants to whack you over the head, you know? And so Muscat does not make a particularly nuanced or uh, elegant brandy, but it's bold. So I, you know, when, a, when you know, Singani is gorgeous and, and, and Pisco's of Muscat are absolutely gorgeous as are many grappas based on that. You know, they, they have this sort of presence, not so much in, 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 these, in these aged brandies, these brown spirits brands, we're looking for more structure and, and more mm -hmm. finesse. And in the white spirits, right? We're looking a little more for that bold fruit like like very classic fruit like in a, in a pear or the vie, we really want pear really ripe pear you know and not a lot of other elements that come through the maturation process it, it think but but it, wine is more like brandy right we want wine you know there are youthful wines where we want that kind of very young vivacity you know mm -hmm. think of a a Beaujolais or even a Beaujolais Nouveau, right? Like doesn't, you know, it can age, you can drink them a few years later, but you really want it in youth to show that kind of bright, you know, floral, fruity youth, you know, whereas other wines, certainly we, we would like to drink more mature and have them undergo right. a bit of maturation, right? So in the same way, brown spirits are more like the latter. Um, but th that's also a good point of differentiation. I mean, and one of the things we wanted to do was talk about why, you know, why American brandy can honor traditions, but why American brandy is uniquely its own, because you've already gone into taking a lot of old world techniques, but applying a whole different regimen because nobody in France is distilling Pinot Noir, right? Probably, right. or Viognier, or correct. And we learned this when we distilled a couple of weeks ago when we were out there with you. It was primarily Pinot Noir with a little bit of Vigne blended in, right? And I remember one of the things you were talking about, which you wouldn't discover until you do it, how you change where your, you know, where the heads were, how much you need, where the, you know, how you handle the fermentation in terms of having acrylin character, 
how you are going to change whether or not well right or to eliminate acrylic character or you to not allow it to develop that's a fermentation problem that uh right that occurs and it's a it's a it's a flaw in the, the whole idea with all the way across so you're already sort of combining the two traditions because you're using very traditional equipment but changing the use of the equipment based on the material that you're presented to use. That's true. And so that's very true. So, I mean, unfortunately, um, uh, we're going to have to like flip back and forth and we're going to actually have to make it into another. So if you look at this piece of equipment, you see this still, uh, which is, uh, you can see the, the, the burner, the still, that, and then the condenser over here, which there's a picture you know, behind Brett. Well, but this thing over my head is a wine preheater. So if you look at cognac, uh, not all distilleries would have all three parts. The pot, they have to have. The condenser, they have to have. But this thing in the center is an extra piece. It's a wine preheater. And what you can do is you can um, place wine in that preheater at the end of one of your distillation cycles and you can run, there's a tube that runs through the center of it that you can run the hot vapor coming out of the still through the preheater to preheat the next batch of wine. The, that, that's kind of nice. Uh, it, it saves a bit of energy, it saves a bit of time actually on the heat up, which is mm, sometimes helpful, sometimes maybe not really. But try to me burners you have underneath your still that are working. That's true too. Uh, that's really true. <laughs> that work that are work that want to work. Uh, um, but if you you can utilize or not utilize the wine preheater to achieve very different styles of brandy. So for instance, uh, the Hennessy style of distillation in cognac, there, there's a number of different classic styles of distillation, and they uh, vary by uh, the use of lees, the, the, the sediment in the wine or the lack thereof, and the way different elements of the distillation sequence are recycled. So we normally think in the most general sense, the most general sense like uh, of the, there are, there are, there's, it's a double distillation cycle here. The first distillation cycle produces something called bouy, which is the equivalent to low wines in whiskey. And then you do, let's say, three of those to refill the still for the second pass. And there you would collect the, uh, the and, and in the bluey distillation, you collect heads as well. So heads and bluey and tails, let's say, three fractions. In the second cycle of distillation called the boncho for the good heat, you collect heads again, you collect the heart, which goes into barrel, you collect the seconds, which somehow are like the bluey, and then the tails heads and tails and bluey and seconds, they're all recombined in one way or another and redistilled back into the process. So the Hennessy style of distillation uses no heavy lees and it does not use a wine preheater. So the style of eau de vie produced for the house of Hennessy does not use this, this, does not use this instrument, does not use, and it has a certain way of incorporating the seconds and the heads and the tails back into the distillation sequence. The Remy Martin classic style of distillation uses the heavy lees in the distillation that makes a fattier, chunkier brandy. Um, it uses the wine preheater to preheat and that preheating actually slowly cooks the brandy. And especially in the presence of those fatty lees produces a distillate that comes out that's different in character. And then the Remy Martin sequence of recycling head sales and seconds and so forth. And there's also the third classic method, which we don't need to go into is the Martel method, which is quite different, but also doesn't use um, the leaves typically. And there's some other, uh, other classic types of distillation sequences. Like think of it like uh, if we think of, 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 of um, of scotch, right? One of those, like, how, how does this, like Springbank has a, right? I mean, they have a kind of a different style of distillation, right? So it's a-, a Very much so, yeah. Right, so there are, so it's not just unique to cognac that you can incorporate things differently and distill differently. It does happen like all over the world, but these things are quite uh, classic there. So we in California, can, we're not locked 
we don't have that kind of rigid house, not rigid. We don't have a traditional house style, right? So we can use this as a tool, right? We can use the heavy leaves or we cannot use the heavy leaves or we can, you know, so, so in something like a Colombard, maybe we do do a Remy style distillation. Whereas with something like a Viognier, maybe we do one of the other more classic styles of distillation. And Viognier, it in and of itself does not produce a brandy of immense finesse, let's say, but uh, produces an, a, a, an absolutely unique brandy with a certain kind of structure that we can utilize in the blending and aging process to produce a brandy of unique character to California. And so I, I always say like our approach to blending is more like a perfumer than you would normally think of in terms of old world, world brandies, right? We're, we're growing things, we're distilling things in different, in, in, in classic ways, but different ways. And we're putting them together in, again, classic, but different combinations to produce a brandy that's quite unique to, to California. What, unique. what are you, what are you looking for off the still for that? Now that you're touching that, because that was a question that we had gotten. What are you looking for off the still that is going to help you determine whether or not something is precocious or long-lived or precocious and long-lived? Or something that has to be just a blending component and nothing else, for example. That's, yeah. That's a good, that's off the still. Uh, sometimes that's hot. It, sometimes it's a sense, right? So like if you look at... Uh, the, the finesse of the distillate coming off of the still, how much structure it has, how much length it has, does it open on dilution or close on dilution? So very rarely do brandies open on dilution. They most normally close uh, on, on rapid dilution. They close right up. But like some eau de vies have this tendency to open, like the Grand Champagne. It's a very, very characteristic thing of the Grand Champagne, this like beautiful opening of the distillate like on dilution. So it's a very standard um, uh, sensory analysis to make of a young eau de vie. But here, what you're looking for, you know, uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a brandy that's really got structure for longevity, right? It's a, it's a, a certain depth and elegance to the nose. It's um, a, a progression, you know, through the nose where you get a sense of depth. It's not all on the top and in the front. There's a sense of depth when you're, when you're smelling it. Um, things, like v, things like Pinot Noir, the, 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 the degree to which it's precocious is the degree to which it opens up really in the mouth. The mouth turns out to be a much, much harder thing to develop. It's a more difficult thing to develop than the nose. The nose can come on early. It can be present like a beautiful nose in the in the young eau de vie, like right from the still, uh, but the oh, things in the other room. But the but the but the mouth tends to be much more difficult and more time-consuming to develop a soft structure in the mouth and to get that to to open. And so you want to have it, like a wine, right? You want to have a ballot like a, a wine for aging, right? Should have enough fruit to support. The, the, the tannin and enough tannin to support the aging process, right? Too much tannin without fruit, you end up with this dry thing, you know, you, the fruit wasn't there to support it. Fruit without tannin, right, doesn't have the potential to last mm -hmm. long enough. You right. Know, to really so in the same way, these eau de vies, we want, you know, there to be enough fruit, enough presence, enough structure, and enough breadth to the, to the, to the spirit. To, to make something that will be long life. Whether or not it develops precociously, like whether or not in five years you can get a spirit that will open up uh, actually remains to be seen. That now uh, you, you, you learn backwards, right? You, you produce something that then you find out is precocious and then you continue to produce it, right? So we know that you, so I guess that's a, maybe the answer to that question is there was no way to know a priori that Pinot Noir would both be precocious and have the ability to age. It's only a posteriori after putting it in the barrel and seeing it for 20 years and doing it 20, 30, 40 years in a row that you go, oh, Pinot Noir 
is does do this thing, right? So now we know, now we know what we're looking for in the brandy of Pinot Noir coming off the still, but you wouldn't have known that in none right. of us. So you kind of have to work backwards from the final result. You have to work backwards and say, okay, these are the characteristics that all these things different have in pieces. And Pinot Noir has this characteristic, which is why it's working better than Viognier, which doesn't share. I mean, that's how you can, I'm assuming that's how you distinguish working backwards what was what. Yeah, and so it's very, so like, you know, uh, 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 this is kind of the fun part. I don't, some people may find this frustrating or, you know, but for me, this is the fun part, right? That um, to make a spirit, like the greatest of the great brandies are, are probably on average, the longest lived of all the brown spirits. So it's very common or it's not uncommon at all that a brandy of 40 to 60 years old will be, you know, at its peak or not, and, and it's not uncommon uh, or it's, it's uncommon, but not extremely rare that brandies can go 80 years in barrel, in wood and still improve, right? So, you know, in the lifetime of a distiller, not even their professional lifetime, just their single lifetime, right? You're gonna get to see like, maybe if you're lucky, one of these things hit, you know, their peak maturity, if, if that's the level of aging that they can achieve, you don't get a chance to go back and change it. Like it's too late at that point to go, oh, you know, I would have done that differently. So there is this, um, there is this natural passing of information from one generation to another generation, right? You really need a master blender or a master distiller, and I use that in the in the true sense of the word, to be able to show you a little bit or to be able to give you insight into what a youthful spirit should look like if it's going to have the ability to really go that distance. Or, or another way of saying that is, how do you try to make a spirit that will be better decades in the future than it is today because that means that today it may be a bit awkward you're not looking for perfection mm -hmm. you want that spirit to have these um elements in it that will give it longevity in the same way that a wine that's going to age for decades probably doesn't taste so good in its youth it's probably got a little more tannin than you know we might want to drink today but if we take a wine that's soft and presents well today it probably doesn't have the ability to really age uh, beneficially for many, many decades. So, you know, if we, if we kind of, you know, move past the, 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 the distillation side of things and then talk, you know, a little bit more about what happens. Uh, well, we kind of are talking about a little bit more like what happens, what happens after that, right? Like what, 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 you know, is the is the sort of next next phase of 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 a brandy's life? So we we produce the ODV, and then there's the whole part of blending and maturing and 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 and, and allowing these spirits to really kind of develop, you know, into the things we consider to be brown spirits. That's kind of the the second, um, it's a whole second, maybe third process, right? It first starts out in the vineyard, right? Like producing mm -hmm. fruit of the right character. We talked about that. And right. then maybe a half step, the winemaking, right? We, we certainly hope we don't produce acrolein. We don't have, you know, those kinds of things. We need clean, crisp wines that are, uh, that are free of faults because mm -hmm. most every fault most uh, every fault will be uh, will be intensified in the distillation process. The, and some things that aren't even faults in wine become faults in distillate because of that intensification during the distillation process. So, and then following the distillation process, the whole aspect of how we facilitate the maturation of those spirits into something that we would consider to be really a well here so then and you're talking so you're you're still so following along as you're learning where 
you kind of knew that part of the tradition and if a lot of people don't know in cognac is that the brandy spends a lot of time getting moved from barrel to barrel depending on how you know getting pre-blended for what are eventually going to be you know for what are eventually going to be bottlings or trying to make some level of consistency whatever at what point in time did you decide at what point in time did you start blending your barrels and then how long did that take before that led to you doing the first Osicalis releases? Oh. What was the timeline for the blending and then actually finally dumping and putting something in bottle and actually getting product out? Oh, it was uh, uh, 13 or more years before we actually put a bottle, wow. you know, and honestly it was, it was like, it was Uber who, uh, and the thing was this, right? So I looked at it. <laughs> I 13 at or it, more years there, before you started yeah. even bottling anything. Yeah. Well, the thing was, uh, I, 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 I've said this often. I've been quoted. I was like, I mean, I could buy a really good bottle of brandy. And Hubert was a good friend. I could buy, you know, he would sell me brandy. Like, it was, you, know, you know, no problem. I didn't, it wasn't that I couldn't, it wasn't that I was making brandy because, I needed to drink brandy and I couldn't afford a decent bottle, right? I was making brandy because I wanted to make a decent bottle. So, you know, I always said to myself, like, I don't want to release, I'm not going to release something until I myself would one night, just one night, I want to have this notion, you know what? I'd actually like to drink something I made tonight over something that somebody else made, you know? And honestly, it took a while before I could actually myself say, what do you want to drink today? You know, they want to drink the stuff. Well, that's, but that's a completely different, that's a completely different mentality than the way, and again, because of commercial necessity, yeah. a different mentality than a lot of craft distillers. Once craft distilling really started hitting, a lot of the craft distillers, because they were approaching it as less of a passion project and a little bit more as a pure business endeavor, they had to have something immediately Whereas you actually had, you know, the mentality from the beginning, but the opportunity to wait. Well, yeah, because I, I mean, uh, you know, a lot of what we do here, I say, are golden handcuffs, right? I mean, we had the opportunity to wait. That's a, kind of a nice sort of euphemism for like what that was, you know, like <laughs> um, th there are times where we, we have kind of not really wanted that opportunity, but it certainly early on, I knew that it took a long time to make great brown spirits. And I, 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 I you know, we, the, so, you know, we, we, we put in as much money into making them as we could, but we never put in money that we felt would need to be recovered in some finite period of time. I don't know, right. you know if that explains it, you know, perfectly. That explains it perfectly. Yeah. I, Dan, just, I, got a, I got a couple of questions about your production process that I kind of want to, you know, put in perspective against some other distillers we see yeah. here. Um, so uh, you started out, you're sourcing grapes and you were sourcing a variety of grapes. You had some colon bar that's really cool. Um, as of now, are you buying juice from anybody else or is this 100% your own wine that you're making and still? 100% our own. 100% your own wine making and still. And you're making it on a traditional Charente uh, still or traditional Armagnac st still. Uh, oh, yeah, and, and, and the Armagnac still is quite unique. It's a continuous pot still, the first continuous mm -hmm. still patented. And the, uh, it's, so it's, a, it's basically 100% bi-directional flow continuous pot still, and the Charente still is a unidirectional flow batch pot still. Batch pot still. Um, now, uh, like how many gallons of, of brandy would you make on a typical year now? This year we made... One, two, three, four hundred gallons. Four hundred gallons on a year, and this is stuff no, you're no, growing no, yourself. No, I mean, this is this no. is absurdly small production. Right. So I guess what I'm trying to get to is like, let me put it. Another well, but there, yeah. I mean, we've Dan, gone, put it in context, though. We've gone from crushing 
in a typical year, like 170 tons of fruit to last year, uh, uh, less than 20 tons of fruit. We're hoping this year it'll be considerably more. Yeah. Um, we only have 27 acres of, of grapes and they're mostly young. So this year our harvest will increase. But we decided when we decided to only produce brandies off of our own vineyards, we basically went to zero. So <laughs> there was a year in the past three years where we produced wow. zero because our vineyards weren't producing and we were we had decided to become 100 percent a state. So we didn't. Yeah. Produce that year. Well, I guess I mean, back up. so this year was very small. I mean, the year before was even smaller, but yeah. uh, but now we're ramping back up, and it'll. Be um, so I mean, if people are going to be looking for an Osocalis bottle on the shelf of their local retailer, local binnies, I mean, what what are you? What's your vision for Osocalis, the brand now, as a bottle? I mean, we've had three or four, I think, in the past. If you include the Apple, yeah. Um, yeah. So, you know, with this whole kind of. Um, move to only producing off of our own vineyards and you know our, our own property uh we we've kind of and and actually you know the beauty of it is that like there is more interest in um you know american brandies made in the united states be they california or be they virginia or mm -hmm. wherever there there is growing growing interest uh you know the 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 bad news about exponential growth is you sometimes don't see it in the beginning. I think that caught us all about a year ago. We didn't really understand what it meant because it's the year, the year over year or the, you know, case over case is like increasing exponentially, but it's still an infinitely small number. Yeah. So hopefully we're in that sort of exponential growth phase for American. Beer. For us though, we are, our goal has always been to focus on like the highest quality brandy that can be produced where we are mm -hmm. to focus on maturing those brandies for um, the amount of time necessary to produce great brandies and our sell and be, be, because you know there was um, not a huge demand on um, you know shall we say handmade American brandies our sellers are actually pretty deep in terms of older stocks. And so I think we've decided, or, you know, I've decided like recently that that's really our forte, right? That's what we do. Well, we have the patience and we have older stocks. So we're, we're really, we, we've removed the apple brandy from the market because it was young, it was 10 years old. And so now when we come back on the market with apple brandy, we're really only going to be selling, much older things, stocks that are 20 and 30 years old. And probably our focus in the grape brandy will become really on releasing, you know, older brandies. So expressions that, you know, really showcase like what, you know, we, we've been able to do. So well, with your, with your brandies in the past, we had three labels. We had, we had fine, we had XO and heritage. And, yep. and also Cal's fine was one of those brandies when I first tasted it, um, you know, before I had met you, it really, it really knocked my socks off in terms of its complexity and its fruit character. And it just was one of those things where it's like, I haven't, I had yet to have an American brandy that tasted like that. Um, so I guess is what, what can we expect to see from your coming bottlings uh, after you draw this barrel sample? Oh, <laughs> No, it's later there than it is here. Mm -hmm. uh, but, um, you know, I think what you're going to see are very specialized releases of older brandies that are all one of, you know, one, not one of a kind, but, you know, single bottlings of single but See, the other thing, I'm looking at the time here. The other thing is the process for producing brandy. So, so. I, I know this is not answering your question and we're taking like mm -hmm. a step back. So I'm kind of aware it's okay. I'm not just rambling, but I, but I tend to do it anyway. Um, um, brandies, like as Brett pointed out, they, they tend to be, uh, we think of them as maturing, right? So there's a certain amount of oak character 
that we want on the brandy. The oak provides, you know, the tannin, the structure, some sugar, other chemical compounds, which are very beneficial to the aging process later on. Mm -hmm. It's not the oak per se that we're looking for. It's not that I want to chew on, you know, the, the, the lignin of a, of a Quercus, you know, tree. It's that what we can get from that, from that wood provides very important ingredients for uh, the, the, the brandy to be able to develop properly. So we put the brandies in, in young oak, uh, we then, once we have enough, once we've extracted enough of that to, to, to suffice for those things, to, to be able to allow the brandies to mature properly, we'll move the brandies out of that new active, very harsh wood, if you will, mm -hmm. and put it into older, softer wood. And, and, and then when we're putting together a brandy, you know, we're asking like, what elements do we want? We spoke about Viognier, we spoke about Colombard, we spoke about, you know, some Faux Blanche or something like, and, and I said like, it's a little bit of a, of, a, of a approach of a perfumer, like what elements can we take and put together to create both a harmonious and complex and elegant spirit? One that has top notes and middle notes and bottom notes, one that has a four palette and a mid palette and a back palette, right? I mean, Jake talked about this sort of, you know, um, you know, tongue mapping and palette mapping, you know, earlier in the series, but that's exactly what we want. We want to sort of be able to experience the range of flavors and aromas that a spirit has to offer. It's really cold here this time of year. So this is like the improper glass for this time of year. But How, what's the what's the temperature range like in that cellar of yours? It's about fifty now, high forties, like high forties, high forties. How warm will it get in there in the summer? Mid sixties, low sixties. Okay, it's not bad. So uh, and then um, now, we want to see that. So we want to see that yearly change. We don't want to see a very rapid change. We want the brandies to have very, we want them to have their winter cold period, their summer warm period where the chemical reactions speed up. But now we're putting together this mm -hmm. uh, brandy, um, you know, throughout its whole life. So we may take Viognier or Pinot Noir, Chenin Blanc, you name it, we put that together in a blend. So all of a sudden you ask like, uh, whoa, whoa, when was it distilled? Oh gosh, <laughs> when was it distilled? I, I mean, I mean, it, there could be 30 pieces in the blend, right? They might come from different years. Well, why would you do it? Why would you do that? Why would you take pieces from different years and different variety? Why would you, because you can put together something that has elements of all of those, not just a single static, year or a single static variety. You can put things together that have nuances of youth, that have nuances of age, that have nuances of leather and nuances of flower and nuances of, of, of fruit, you know? And so by being able to put something together like that, you end up with the ability to produce a much more complex spirit and, and to express a much wider range of flavors and aromas that you would otherwise, but you lose the ability- It's a foreign to concept to, I think, a lot of whiskey production now, you know? But it's, so not, it's like, that's, very that's much not so, at all yeah. the way we approach making a lot of bourbon. It's not, it's not that different. I mean, we do that with whiskeys, but it's not done to that same level. Um, and, and for, you know, the very purposeful um, you know, for lack of a better word, I guess, about a tongue mapping kind of approach to it. Um, right. You know, it's it, things blended in whiskey, I think, more for to, to create a consistent flavor than to uh, necessarily add like, like some immense character or depth, you know. But that's that's true now. And that wasn't true with classic blended Scotch whiskeys. Right. I mean, they were really produced. Mm -hmm. Same, I and mean, that's why we have the range of things in the same the, way, yeah. The same islands to the highlands to the lowlands to 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 the spay, right? I mean, when we put those together in a really creative way, you mm -hmm. can achieve the same kind of results. I think, to a great degree, 
it's a, a little bit of lack of understanding, a great degree of mistrust, and um, and then in, in some respects a little bit of biasness towards the 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 clarity and simplicity simplicity of a single cask, single year, single everything. Then you know exactly what it is, but what you lose is the ability. Well, that that delivers on a level of transparency that I think people want these days. You know, like but, like bottled and bond act. The, we we get more requests for bottled and bond product than ever now, and I think it's because people know exactly what they're going to get. You know, yes, and it's just and it's right. not that uh, it's not you know dishonest. Like brandy blending isn't dishonest. It's just uh, it's just becoming a very different language. I think than than that kind of single cask single vintage you know you know single you know bottled and bond single barrel type of mentality that we see a lot in american whiskey these days right and that's why i say that stems in some cases i think from a, a mistrust of the marketplace whereas you know if i if i look at uh, scotch whiskeys and i look at great blenders right like the faith in some and you guys have some of these things you you, you know beautiful things by people, you know, who are extremely artistic and extremely knowledge and can, and can put these things together in a way that it can express a completely different idea, a completely different flavor. You know, I, 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 I use the analogy sometimes that like, it's not that painting with a one pure color means that you can't achieve great art. Like Picasso did have his blue period, I say all the time, right? And I would love to own one of those pieces. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no doubt I'm not going to say that I would not have it. But if you, when you give an artist a full palette of colors to work with, you can achieve a very different painting, right? And so, but if you, if you are worried about chicanery mm -hmm. or trickery or cutting corners, then, then all these things start to really uh, somehow impart a, 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 a truth or a, a level of integrity to the consumer that they they like to see, but in terms of you know brandies and you know unfortunately we don't have time to really delve into other aspects of the maturation process and why we do and why these barrels look the way they do. They look the way they do uh, because the we, the maturation process is a very complicated interplay between chemistry and biology. Suffice it to say, in the time we have remaining, um, and 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 we and we. It's all right, we're doing we're doing fine on time. I mean, I had a couple questions about go this ahead. anyway. You ask questions, and I'll and I'll try so, to not go long. Well, I mean, I just more so. I just want to kind of dumb it down to our to you know my whiskey drinking self. I, I assume all these barrels are French oak barrels. Um, do they get just a toast before you use them? Are they raw? Do they ever get a char? Um, they, uh, do you try to source barrels from the same kind of uh, oak forest that like traditional Armagnac and Cognac barrels may come from? We, we now uh, purchase all our own stave wood and, 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 and age all our own stave wood in France. I will say in the past, in both the wine program and in, in the distillation program, we have um, purchased wood from the United States, aged it in the United States. We've purchased wood from the United States and aged it in, in, in France. Uh, and in fact, unfortunately, the real, the only aspect of this, which I, I wanted to be 100% American. So we, I played around with all kinds of American oak for years, but American oak has a very, certain kind of heavy lactone quality, that banana, coconut, you know, that thing, which doesn't mm -hmm. lend itself as elegantly to brandies. I, from my palate, um, as French oak or European mm -hmm. oak in general, not just French oak, but European oak. So I, I quickly, within the first 10 years of producing, really focused on European oak. It, it, it gives me the kinds of results that I really want. So it's unfortunately quite expensive. Each one of, you know, these like newer barrels, which is, you know, there's some newer barrels like sitting here. Those are each running us now maybe a thousand bucks a piece as opposed to, you know, a small fraction of that for an American oak barrel. 
but um, mm -hmm. but so and so we are sourcing. So right now we're aging at the moment wood from the center of France from Limousin. Those are two different species. The latter, Quercus robar or English mm -hmm. oak or pedunculate oak. The former, uh, Petraea mm -hmm. or sessile oak. We have some oak from the Vosges mm -hmm. forest. Some more oak from the Gas the Pyrenees, the Gascon forests. The uh, and then um, we're we're expanding, you know, with with a, a, a little bit of of other uh, more eastern oaks. So uh, most of everything is. Quercus robar. We have uh, uh, a limited amount of Quercus petraea, but we do have some Tonsé, some Quercus petraea wood in here as well. And we do buy uh, an age, a smaller quantity of that uh, every year as well. So that's, the barrels are never charred. Um, charring, so one of the fundamental differences, the most fundamental difference between American oak, which is predominantly Quercus alba, white American oak, and, and, and the European oak species is in the level of tannins that they have. European oaks have a much, much higher level of tannins. American oak has a very small amount of tannins. And we've talked a little bit about those lactones, mm -hmm. but, um, but with wine, that's not as much of an issue because the grapes provide, the, 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 the juice provides this sort of tannic structure. If we think of ciders as well, right? Tannin in a right. great cider apple, right? It provides the structure and the mouthfeel for the wine or the cider and so forth. In spirits, we don't start life with tannin in the spirits. So that structure, if you want to develop mouthfeel, needs to come to a great degree from the barrel, from extraction. In the case of of, of aromatized wines, we can do it differently as well. We can add certain, we can add, but, but it's the same mm -hmm. thing, right? It's, a, it's the same notion of what the structure within our, what, how we want the thing to taste and to feel and to work within our mouth. So uh, uh, charring is a more common practice to American oak because charring provides a bit more structure in terms of the way the barrel and parts character uh, to the spirit. We don't need to do that uh, with European oak because we can actually extract tannins um, at a significant level that will provide that structure. And so we never char these barrels. They're always toasted. Usually mm -hmm. we would call it out as non-blistered, which means like blistering, like charring is blistering taken to like the end to infinity but usually there's yeah. a small amount of popping or separation on the inside of the barrel that produces a very like a micro char and once you see those bli they're called blisters you know and once you see that blistering you've really achieved about the maximum level of toast that we want to see now the toasting like if we look at charring like what is like number three char is standard number three char is like are we talking 40 seconds forget I, I 45 have, something like 45, 45 seconds in right? a typical yeah. barrel, both for wine but especially for brandy the toasting process is about an hour and a half to two hours that's sitting over an open wooden flame so it's a very deep penetration so sometimes it's uh misconstrued that actually charring gives deeper penetration into the wood than toasting, but it's actually the reverse. And the, and the reason why is because wood is not very thermally conductive. Yep. So it's like, it basically is an insulator. So even if you take a number three charred barrel, you can still put your hand on the outside of the barrel after it's been charred or during the process, if you were strong or crazy enough to get near the dang thing. But, uh, but if you were to put your hand on the outside <laughs> of a, of a, of a brandy barrel you would feel a lot of heat because it's been so long on a so it's a low slow toast versus an intense fast charring process so um yeah. it's just different it's different it gives different characteristics and different structures i find that it works better with fruit uh than otherwise but that's that's my palate there are there are plenty of great brandies uh that are made otherwise yeah more random production questions. What's the big tank over your right shoulder? That's a blending tank. So when we take from these barrels, right, and put together a blend, 
then we have to consolidate them in one place. That tank is the place where we can consolidate them, put together the blends, marry the blends. And then most commonly they go back to barrel to do aging. And so something else actually remains in the tank. And that's uh, typically called Feb or, uh, or Petit O. It's brandy that's taken down to uh, low proof to provide leverage for us to both. So the brandy is, uh, and this one is actually sitting at about, I'd have to look, but it's sitting at about 41% alcohol. The brandies are brought down over time to low proof because, uh, you know, cask strength, starting from the beginning, we said that alcohol, we have a love-hate relationship with alcohol. It does some things, it provides us with opportunities to do some things, and it closes the door on other opportunities, right? So too much alcohol in the brandy makes it more neutral and more dull. Too little, and we won't be able to carry over the flavor components that are soluble in alcohol. So it, the, the, as, a, as, a, as a, a, a transporter, if you will, of aromatic compounds, it's absolutely necessary. And as well, it functions the same way in the glass and in the barrel, right? It allows certain components to be dissolved in the liquid. It gives aromaticity to the brandies. It gives structure in the mouth. So a, like a little bit of it is good. At very, very high alcohol levels, we would, coming off the Charente still, we typically would come off, a barrel would be at like 70, 71% alcohol. If we just put the brandies in at 70, 71% alcohol and leave them there for short periods of time, they don't really develop. At that point, the alcohol is a preservative, right? I mean, you could put, you know, I don't know, like what's, in the old days, right? You know, you would preserve a lot of things in alcohol, but it's because it retards the decay process or the oxy, it retards the mm -hmm. oxidation process. It retards the development process, right? Now over long periods of time, if we're actually gonna age that brandy for 60, 70 years, we need it to start up at high proof so that it, ha it has the ability to lose alcohol over time and not just, you know, be, be washed out. But if we're gonna do something young, uh, 15 years, 20 years, right? Then we need to be able to bring those brandies down in alcohol level so that they, they can, they can gain all the flavor compounds that are available to the brandy during the maturation process, right? So for one thing, just like if we were to illustrate this with one point, it would be sugar. Like none of the sugars in the wood are soluble in high proof alcohol. Do the experiment on your bench top, right? Take 70% alcohol, put a sugar cube in it, not going anywhere for, a, for long. Take 30% alcohol and drop the sugar cube in it and you'll get you'll hmm. get some solubility of the sugar in alcohol. Sugar is not soluble in a non-polar solvent. It's soluble in a polar solvent. Water is a much better medium for pulling out sugars than alcohol is. And if you want to get sugars and other flavor compounds from the wood, you can't do it only at high proof. So you have to be able to age the spirits across the whole range of uh, alcohol volumes to be able to get that kind of complexity we're looking for. And then the question is, where is there the most intensity in the aromatic compounds from the spirit? So typically uh, that most commonly falls at around 40% because above, too much above that, I mean, it's not always there, it's just a round number, right? Too much above that, and many of the things that we want to smell in the nose of the spirit are too soluble in the alcohol, and they'll sit in the liquid phase, and they won't make, they won't come up into the vapor phase. But by decreasing their solubility, like making them more uncomfortable, if you will, they, you, you, you force them out of the liquid and into the vapor, and the brandies or the spirit in general becomes more aromatic. Hmm. In the limit, that's not true, right? If we dilute it infinitely, we've just diluted everything away. And so one of the major games that takes you know, a lot of time and a lot of effort is the slow dilution of these brandies down over time to be able to both get more out of their developmental process during the maturation 
and to make them more aromatic when we finally bottle them and put them in glass. And one of the last things we do, this actually comes back to answering the question. I was about to ask, <laughs> we were gonna get back to that. Well done. <laughs> one of the last things we do is we make a final dilution step to the brandy prior to bottling. But if you add water at that step, you're really just diluting. If I add water to the brandies in their first year, they age together for another 19 years, let's say. And so it's not really a dilution because that, that, that brandy has now incorporated it and that's participated in all the chemical reactions. It's really become core to the brandy. It's not a dilution anymore. As you get closer and closer to the bottling stage, adding water becomes more and more a dilution and less and less an integral mm -hmm. piece of the brandy. So when we make, but yet, as I just said, we want these things to be like at their peak aromaticity when we get them in the bottle and when we taste them. One of the ways we achieve that is by using this stuff called petio, which is what's in this tank right now. Petio is a very weak- The crap brandy. in the bottom of the tank. It's not the crap in the bottom of the tank. It's a very weak brandy, which we age for brand. decades, you know? And so that mm. can provide the leverage to bring the brandies just down before bottling to where we want to see them without actually doing that dilution thing, you know? So it, it allows us mm -hmm. the leverage to bring them down. But this is, this Petio there is like 15 years old already. So uh, it's, a, it's a very expensive process uh, because it takes a lot of space for very, you know, uh, low uh, alcohol brandy. It's much more mm -hmm. efficient, way more efficient. I, I, you know, I would get a lot more bottles of brandy to be able to age in the cellar if I would put everything up and keep everything up at 70% alcohol. When I have the alcohol, I double the amount of barrels I need roughly speaking, and I have the amount of brandy that I can house in the same facility. So it's much more efficient yeah. to keep them at high proof, but it's not as beneficial to the final product. Is now, is that an American standard barrel in the upper left corner or my left, your right, I suppose there's in the corner behind you, there's a smaller barrel that looks more of the size of like a bourbon barrel. No, that's, that's a, I'll okay. Because the, 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 the lens is, is tweaked on this camera. Well, and you have a few smaller that you've done and, and they're, and, and cause you have some smaller barrels there, right. That you're using some of them transitional, some of them. Yeah. So we do use a range of cooperage, right? Now this cooperage is much smaller, uh, ranging from let's say 15 gallons to 30 gallons. So this is small cooperage, but the only reason why we keep that small cooper and actually um, there's another rack of cooperage here. These are standard uh, wine barrels. So these are 60 gallon barrels, but the reason mm -hmm. why we have, but everything you see uh, back, back here is, uh, is um, 100 gallon or 100 or four, 350 and 400 liter barrels. So 90 and like approximately a hundred gallon uh, of barrels. And the reason why the, well, the reason why the Cooper's is this size predominantly is because that provides us the best surface area to volume ratio for long-term maturation of the spirits, much smaller than that. Yeah. And the spirits just get, they, they don't have the ability. Too woody. They're too woody and there's too much oxygen per unit time. They need to mature. There needs to be a, a balance and a harmony to the way in which the chemical reactions progress during the aging process. Some chemical reactions are slow. Some chemical reactions are fast. Some chemical reactions are oxygen dependent. Others are not. And to get the right sequence of maturation, you kind of sometimes need to wait for the slow guys to produce what they're going to produce before the fast guys mm -hmm. kick in and do what they're doing. So we can make some go faster by just getting more oxygen, but not all. And so if you really want the most um, breadth in the spirit, you know, each spirit has its own 
uh, pace, right? Which it can optimally age at. It's not all the same, but for brandy, these larger casks, longer time periods are much more beneficial. Now we have the smaller cooperage because sometimes we just don't have enough of one thing to fill a whole big barrel. So when I'm left with a small piece, I either am going to leave it in a large barrel with a large amount of head space or put it in smaller cooperage with like less head space. The latter is pre preferred for that. So all the smaller cooperage that you saw is all old neutral cooperage. It's, none of it is providing any active wood anymore. Um, but, it, but it is, you know, if I put it in glass, it would age, but the, the, the legal clock stops, even though the actual clock mm -hmm. doesn't stop, but it doesn't, it doesn't mature in the same way that it would in wood. So that's why we have a range of yeah. barrel sizes. What's, um, we had a request to see some of those old barrel tags. What's like the oldest, most interesting barrel you have sitting around in there, in your opinion? Well, uh, <laughs> um, some of these barrels themselves are are old. The, the tags, I mean, um, that's going back, you know, uh, one. okay, so a lot of them, unfortunately, okay, so here we go again. Let me, let me try to show you. Okay, that's easy, right? Some of them are like single. I don't know if you can see this. Wait, lumbar, right? So that that's not not that that's not that that's old, but that's straightforward, right? Some of them, more commonly, if they've been blended, these have a lot number. They have a complicated lot number, and there's a deed code book, if you will, that has what went into that lot. I'm trying to find one that's. I'm not allowed to climb any more. Oh, here we go. Um, here's one, right? Blend Why 1601 at, well, <laughs> uh, because uh, I have a big piece of metal and plastic in my right shoulder. And uh, <laughs> the doctor that put it in there said like, please just through the basic recuperating process before you destroy my handiwork again. Um, so, so, um, so there's a code there like with a blend number. Once we put together, once I put together a blend, it has a lot number or a blend number associated with it, but it no longer. So if you ask me, what's the like sexiest thing, it might be like blend 206, right? I, 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 I'm very partial or 1310. Like I'm very partial to this blend number, but it's not going to be a vintage single varietal. There are some beautiful single varietal vintage things. Like mm -hmm. I'm, I'm particularly partial uh, to the 97 vintage or the six vintage of DNA, um, you know, which talks about I, I particularly like this cask, but I, I uh, but I, I have many, many less casks that are labeled um, in a way that would make it, um, uh, well, trans the, the level of transparency just, it comes through this kind of interaction, right? It comes through people visiting, people talking, people tasting, mm -hmm. through Zoom conversations, through people asking questions and getting answers. It doesn't have to come through the label. You, do yourself an injustice if you demand simplicity on the label, because in some cases that will follow with simplicity in the bottle. Um, in some cases, you know, not 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 all. I, I, I'm sending a. Yeah. a I will. I mean, which Pat there, I haven't nice shown you yet. My biggest takeaway from this is how. Go ahead. No. I was going to say my biggest takeaway from this is this is anything but simple. I mean, this is a uh, it's it's a strikingly more hands-on process than a lot of the best whiskeys in the world are incredibly industrial products, and that's not taking anything at all away from them. Um, even Springbank, that is totally made by hand, 
is made on an, on a level of industrialization that you know is is leaps and bounds above everything you're doing here and i think a lot of it starts with the raw material and you know and it's it's it seems like it's just a more malleable easier to work with product i guess cereal grains i'm not really sure how to put it but the yields are so so much higher than grapes and it just seems like it's 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 not that it's easy but it's it's can be as simple as fermenting them, distilling them, putting them in a barrel and waiting a while. And there's a lot more tinkering involved here. It used to be that way. I think it always used to be that way. I think, I think in the early 1800s or mid 1800s, it was probably more work to make a barrel of whiskey than it was a barrel of brandy because to hand harvest barley and hand thresh barley, True and then grind the barley and make the beer, do the distillation, that was a lot of work. And more work than to hand harvest grapes, press the grapes, make the wine and do the distillation. So I think in the early 1800s, whiskey was a much more difficult thing to make. With the advent of mechanization, it changed. All of a sudden you could harvest grains and you could store grains for, mm -hmm all year so it, it, it became easier to make an industrialized process out of whiskey it doesn't it's not in any way doesn't take away from the beauty of grain and malt beverages right of course it just it just is what it is still still today you know we're stuck with the fact that um you know the yields from grapes it's it's hard to imagine that a sweet grape would produce you know something like a fifth or a fourth of the amount of of distillate that a that a that barley would produce but it's true and secondly yeah the fact that you can store one just lends itself but the thing is that's why i say a lot of the aspects of what we're talking about here are golden handcuffs right we can't mechanize the growth to you need the, you know the growing phase you can mechanize the harvest actually of, of grapes that 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 you can do um, but you can't store the wines indefinitely and you can't. And so, you know, and, and so because of that, there's not a lot of added extras. Like every time we move a brandy from one barrel to the other, we have to pay labor, right? There's a labor cost involved. Mm -hmm. There's a loss, an actual physical loss to the angel's share. So you, if you minimize the amount of times you touch the spirit, it's a lot cheaper. But the thing is, if I pay $100, that's too cheap. If I pay $200 for my barrel or $1,000 for my barrel, at $200, I can start to really think about like where I can make all these small cost savings here, there, and there. If, you know, at large volumes, I can do the same thing, right? Little margins add up. Once you start to really sort of take on this, 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 this sort of and I'm not the only one, right? I mean, this is mm -hmm. common to like many brandy producers around the world. Once you start to take on these aspects of more expensive wood and more expensive hand harvesting and more expensive hand labor in the fields, then it doesn't pay to cut any corners, if you will, in the maturation and aging process. So these things like petit o and these things like moving from barrel to barrel, they don't cost a lot more. You've already spent so much money to begin with that these little mm -hmm. bits, they're small add-ons. And if they really increase the quality of the product significantly, well worth the extra costs. Whereas unfortunately, when things can become more mechanized and more industrialized, there's more of a motivation to uh minimize the times you touch it or the times you handle it and it produces a different mm -hmm. outcome you may love it you may not love it but it but it does produce a different outcome hmm. so i i don't it's not a like a a, a value judgment it just it kind of is what it is so and we're kind of stuck with it's it just different that you know it just costs us a lot for our fruit and costs us a lot to do what we do and so we might as well just put in that extra bit, you know, and uh, yeah, and look. there's and I mean, I think the tinkering is a, a little bit because to a certain extent, you know, look, look, we were all at a thrust together, right. as a, for instance, one time watching a batch of what was 
going to be what 33 to 50 percent of a batch of johnny walker black label was being constructed mm -hmm. and what was happening there was a semi unloaded 100 barrels and all got dumped into one cistern and blended together right so to a certain extent it's a variant of what you're doing except they do it once at the very end you're doing kind of a bit of the process to try to get to it, it, all kinds of little different cohesive things, but you're kind of trying to get to a cohesive thing. You're just doing it in midstream. Yeah, but there's a difference, right? So the so it's sort of like uh, I don't know what's the analogy. Like it's kind of like a cocktail, right? A cocktail is blended in the moment for the moment, and it has to taste good right now, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas if you were to put those components together and let them marry, you might make that drink differently if they were going to spend a lot of time together, you know? And so, um, you know, what we do by blending early and allowing those things to co-age and co-develop, it means they, they just are a different product than if we were to just make that blend at the very last minute, I, I, you know, they're just a different, it's just a different product. It's a different way of doing things. It gives you a different mouthfeel and different flavor, not better, not worse, but absolutely different and intentional yeah. on purpose, you know. <laughs> I don't, I don't, it, 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 but it's no, but that it, makes, I mean, it's a different, it doesn't it's require a different, more guess, explanation, <laughs> right? What? Yeah, it doesn't require more explanation or anything, it's just, it's different, it is what it is. Yeah, um, yeah, Dan, Dan what's the next, what's the next bottling of Osocalis going to be, or when is it going to be? I mean, if people have seen this and want to get their hands on some Osocalis. I mean, I personally think that the, the the rare at we sell it for forty five dollars is just an incredible bargain, considering all of this that goes into making it. It's probably the. I would I would I would I would I would if you're interested I would get your hands on the bottle of rare because it, it it might become very rare in the near future. Okay. Uh, but I don't know. I don't advice. I, 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 you will be the first to know. And if I knew the answer to that question, I would honestly answer it, but I don't know, but I do know that our focus now is going to be much, much, much more on, um, the, the, uh, older offerings that we feel are unique to what we have here in the cellar. Um, and what we can offer uniquely to customers and the marketplace, um, that, that not and really and there, yep. and I might Pat when you come in when you come in tomorrow I might have some insight for you, <laughs> or a couple of insights okay. for you, sitting on the desk, <laughs> as to what might possibly be a, a bridge to uh, some future bottlings. But I mean, so um, I mean, yeah. no, go ahead. No, I'd rather answer a question. I'll well, I was just going to, you know, we've, we've been going on this for a while now. I guess I was just going to ask you um, briefly about um, you have another distillery project going and uh, if you can well, share anything with that. And then um, yeah. really, if we're going to uh, see anything else, if there's anything else to discuss tonight, really. Oh, I mean, there's a, I mean, honestly, like, you know, someday we can discuss, like, how does an Armagnac still work? How does an mm. Arte still work? How do you put together blends? What do those oaks look like? What does it, you know, how, how the, that, you know, what are the real like under the hood nuts and bolts of how these things work? But we've covered a lot of ground tonight in terms of like conceptual frameworks, maybe a little bit of the whys and less of the hows. And I honestly think that why is the most important question always. The how is, the how is meaningless without understanding the why. And so, you know, how people do things, uh, is totally dependent, you know, on why they do. But anyway, so we've covered that. In terms of like, what else is coming? Yeah, we, I do have a new project um, in New York. We've planted so far 30 acres and we'll have 80 acres in our own estates dedicated to apples and grapes, different varieties of wow. grapes. Because this is in the Hudson Valley. Um, so we have to grow completely. There, there's one grape variety that would be in common to the West Coast and East Coast project. It's a, uh, and the new, project is uh, Clock Estates in Hudson, New York, um, K-L-O-C-K-E. Um, 
Riesling is common to both of them. Much, much more of a focus on the New York project because it's really the only vinifera variety that um, does really well in that climate. But we're also able to grow Vidal, which was a, a hybrid actually first grown, uh, first produced in cognac as a grape for cognac, which has become a wine uh, staple for East Coast wine. Hmm. But we're actually going to be using it for its original intended purpose. And then things like Baco Blanc, which we actually just sent uh, a, 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 I just, so we have a nursery block here in California, which went to a nursery to do all our grafting and that material will be planted next year. Not, not 2022, unfortunately, but 2023 into New York. So we'll be seeing fruit come off of that in, 2027. Uh, uh, so, so tune in in 2020. No, we will start. We, our goal is to start producing with purchased grapes again in New York. Uh, as we, we already have, as I said, like we'll have 30 acres of vines this year planted already, but it'll be a few years before we're actually able to get commercial size production off of them. So, in the meantime, we're working with other growers in the area um, to, 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 to buy fruit that we'll use for our, for our distillation. And we hope to start, you know, hopefully about this time next year. So, so that, that's an interesting project. And again, you know, that's aimed at really trying to understand what aspects of the Eastern uh, region terroir, if you will. Terroir is something that has to be discovered over time. So we don't uh, know what that is, but that's what we're hoping to explore. Like what kinds of expressions we can get out of fruit grown in the Hudson Valley for brandy production. So, so that, that's interesting. And that'll be coming down the pike like right, right, right soon, uh, at least on my time scale, right soon. <laughs> in the next decade or so. <laughs> well, yeah. and and I think we did with that coming up. I mean, this series is going to is going to continue on. And I think that we did, you know, this is what we talked about today or what in what you sort of laid out is insight into one a, a pioneering way of, of of approaching this that's pioneering for the United States, but very much not would not be considered pioneering in cognac, of course, because that's kind of what they do to a certain extent. So we're, we're going to be exploring the other different approaches and, in fact, might have an opportunity to talk to you at the New York facility so we can talk yeah. a, a little bit more about that as well as um, eventually, as we've discussed, talking to we're going to talk to some our fo folks at Copper and Kings coming up just to, to get their take on another variant of sort of their new American brandy. And we're going to be talking mm -hmm. to an O to V producer somebody who did decide to go on the path that you chose not to go on? They're brave souls and they deserve like all the support we could possibly give them because there's some ODV producers doing like wonderful things in the United States and they're, they're let's not make them fall on the, fall on the sword. <laughs> it's great. Right. It's well, great then, stuff. It's just that classic, nobody, everybody wants to try it, but then it's like, what do I do with the other seven eighths of the bottle, you know? And, and I, I just think it's, some it's point, such a foreign liquor to a lot of people in the U.S. Yeah. It's just, it's tough. It's a tough nut to crack. Oh. And again, the other side of domestic brandy, I think at some point in time, maybe we try to talk to our friend Dave Werder in Fresno. Mm -hmm. And depending upon what he, at, at, at the threat of death, what he's allowed to reveal and talk about for his very, 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 <laughs> very large company that's doing very, 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 very large production. Yeah. You know, another take on where American brandy is coming from. Absolutely, mm -hmm. and a really interesting take, and like you know, and they've made you know major inroads now with the um, California Brandy House in, in in Napa, California. So you know, really understanding you know age spirits that come from fruit is 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 kind of it, it, it's moving forward. I mean, plus you know, you have a, I, I, I sh your customers are varied, knowledgeable, you know, inquisitive. So, uh, you know, I'm interested. I never know how these kinds of things are perceived by the people that are receiving them. I only know, you know, how the, the goofball that's actually giving it, you know, thinks it's coming off. But 
but it but it but it would be interesting to get you know feedback as to what people think about about fruit based beers brandies this, this this sequence has been you know quite quite interesting and, and helpful so. well i mean the lesson tonight i guess is if you're interested in dan's brandies he currently really doesn't have anything to sell you um <laughs> you can email spirits at binnies dot com. I'll let you know what we, we do have. So we we do have some. We do have <laughs> some rare. Stores. Yeah, we do have some rare in some stores. We've got some XL in some stores. We have. We even have some, some heritage uh, in some stores. Uh yeah, we've got some heritage in a couple places, and a couple of bottles of apple brandy that probably won't be there for long because I need to buy one of those myself. <laughs> Soon to be collector items, I suppose. Yeah, and I um, just, you know, quickly point out just so we, like the heritage is, I have to look at that body, but that's 22 years old, I think. That's a, that's a, that, that, that actually. Uh, wow. Is, is, but the, the XO that you have is no younger than uh, 15 years and probably has brandies in it that go back almost to 22, smaller percentage, but almost to 22. And the rare is no younger than four and has brandies that go back, I would say about 14 years. I could look at the exact blend of what you have, but that's kind of, if you're talking about like what goes into those bottles, that's, that's what today is in those bottles. Those are pretty good values for what's in those bottles then all things considered for sure. So yeah, so, yeah hundred percent. Right, well, and then other, and other projects, other projects to be revealed as time. Permits. One last question, Dan. What's hanging from the ceiling behind you? Uh, I actually, you could probably get a better answer from one of the other participants. There, so <laughs> so that those for for folks that are watching, just so there is the the Benny's Osakalis connection on on numerous different <laughs> levels. Those are two country hams. One from Penn Valley, one from Keynes, both in central Kentucky. Uh, so in a discussion amongst our, our, our mutual love of whiskey and our mutual love of ham, the, the, the discussion came up, well, what are we doing with Kentucky ham, which is one of the versions of an, of an heirloom, if there's such a thing as an heirloom American ham <laughs> that is and can be aged a la prosciutto in Italy, a la jamon of various different forms in Spain. And so Dan, in a discussion whilst eating a country ham, explained that you really can't get that final step over until it's hung and aged properly. And we need some exposure to heat. So this is, those hams are going to live uh, a couple of years in the cellar, right? Until they start to drip. We need to get a good summer into them. Because yep. last year they came in September, right? So we need at least yeah, one good summer. Did. They've only seen cool weather. We need, they need to get a little, they need to get it. Yeah. Yeah. They're in the, they're in the warmest spot of the shade. So. Yes. But those are, those are Kentucky hams that will very much uh, redefine what, uh, as Keynes calls themselves, Kentucky caviar. <laughs> and this is going to redefine yeah. the concept of Kentucky caviar. Absolutely. Well, we'll have to do an internet tasting of those as well. Absolutely, definitely. <laughs> and yeah, Paul, Paul, your question is you have to, well, I don't think we've broached with Dan the idea of making a brandy pachuga with one of the hams, which a question came from one of our, one of our, our, our regular friends, Paul. That's a, that's an interesting, um, it can't be done in that. I don't arc. think you want to have to clean the still. No. Right. Yeah. Apple brandy with a ham yeah. in the still would actually Paul's be pretty excellent. Paul's suggesting making apple brandy with ham in the still. There you and go. it would be a good way to get that heat consolidated down. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. You have to do it. You have to do it when Callum is home because somebody's got to climb in there and clean it out after you get ham juice all over the inside of the still. That is a yeah. I mean, <laughs> all those stills are still cleaned by hand. You have to crawl in there and scrub it. You want to know like what you know, clean and it's done every two weeks, right? So it's like copper pots, like that's a big copper pot to clean and with the fat and everything that could be exciting that's just making my shoulder hurt more as i think about it i definitely <laughs> gotta get the, 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 the child labor back in no he's over 18 so it's legal <laughs> all right well uh dan thanks for your time tonight um no. you know obviously this could stretch on for hours if we wanted to keep talking about brandy production 
but um, hopefully we can, you know, kind of connect the dots here between what we've talked about here tonight, what we've talked about the previous weeks and what we're going to talk about in the coming weeks. So yeah, you have a, you have a, I have, I have, I have all the faith that we will. You, you do. You have a great list of producers that are going to give a lot of insight to, 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 to the, the, really the myriad of aspects of, of this sort of backwater corner of brown spirits in the United States. So ciao. See you guys later. All right, guys. See you next hey, week. Brett, do we have anybody lined up for Monday? Uh, Who do we have lined up for Monday? Give, give me a couple seconds. We'll have somebody set up for Monday. For those that are listening, you know, join us okay. next Monday. Dan, are you going to be still at home or are you going to be in New York by then? I'll be available to tune in. Okay. okay. So, so um, we'll be back Monday. Keep an eye on the Binny's website. Brett and I will be back Wednesday and Friday this week. Wednesday with John O'Connell from uh, West Cork Irish Whiskey and Friday for with Patrick's Day. Austin from Dickel. So, we're going to be right. tasting the new 15-year single barrel Dickel, so it should be fun. All right, Dan, thanks again, man. We'll see you. Everybody else, cheers. Thanks for joining us tonight. Um, and thanks for sticking around for this see you soon. meandering discussion on Osa Cal's brandy. All right, we'll see you next time. Bye. See you guys. Bye.